I want to discuss the uh, history of Hanukkah. Uh, Hanukkah may have uh, actually the most interesting historical background of all of the Jewish holidays, and it's worthwhile to uh, familiarize ourselves a little bit uh, with the story of Hanukkah. Uh, I have to start back with the fact that there was an old Messiah in Klal Yisrael that until the coming of Mashiach, there are going to be four kingdoms that will rule over the Jewish people. These are called the four Malchuyais. And the Medrash says that the source of the four Malchuyais is built into the very beginning of creation. The second Pasuk of the Chumash talks about the world before Hashem formed everything. So it says in Bereshis, Pasuk Beis, the Aretz Haisa Sohu Vavohu Vachoshech Al Pnei Tahom. Uh, the earth was tayu. Tayu means astonishingly empty. Vayu means jumbled. Now already you see, tova vayu is actually a contradiction in its... Uh, tayu means empty. Vayu means confused and jumbled. Well, something's empty. How is it confused and jumbled? The answer is tayu vayu is that state of confusion where different things are happening. And then it says v'chayshach. And there was darkness. Al Pnei to home on the spirit of the depths, the deep waters. Veruach Elokim and the spirit of God, Mirachefes, was hovering Al Pnei Hamayim over the water. Now, again, this whole Pasuk is very difficult because if you're describing what things were like before Hashem created, well, before Hashem created, there was nothing. So how can you talk about Tayu Vavayu? How can you talk about Choshech? How can you talk about to home deep waters? Where are those deep waters from? Right, so the Medrash says this is a remnant of prior worlds that Hashem had created. So the simple meaning of the Chumash is the Chumash is describing a confusion, an emptiness, a darkness over the face of the deep waters. But the Medrash Rabbah tells us that this is also an allusion to the unfolding of the four kingdoms that will enslave the Jewish people. Tayu, emptiness, is a reference to Babylonia, Bavel, which destroyed the Beis Hamikdash and emptied the world of that holiness. Bayu is confusion. That refers to Persia. We find that during the Persian rule, that's when Haman had this decree against the Jews. And when all of a sudden people read that the Jews are going to be wiped out, even the Gaib didn't understand what that was. The, 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 the lesson of the Pasuk in Megillah is, Ho'ir Shushan Nevaicha. The city of Shushan was confused. Right? I hope you could see the connection we talked about in the Rambam. Nevocha more nevuchim. See, same word? More nevuchim. Guide to the confused. Ha'ir Shushan Navocha, the city of Shushan was confused. So actually, we do have a connection to the Rambam, so I'm Yaitse my Yechiv, so to speak. Okay, then it says, V'choshech, darkness, refers to Greece, which darkened our eyes with the evil decrees <laughs> of Antiochus. And Al Pnei Tahom, on the face of the depth, is the allusion to the Roman Gullus, because the Roman Gullus is by far the longest Gullus that we have. We're still in it. And it's like dropping something, like dropping a penny in the ocean, waiting till it hits the bottom, so to speak. The, it never seems to end. So, Tayu is Bavel, Vayhu is Paras, Chayshech is Yavan, Al Pnei Tahom is the Gullus of Edaim, and then the end of the Pasuk, the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. That refers to Mashiach, who is filled with the Spirit of Hashem. And the waters is the merit of Torah that's compared to water, that in the merit of Torah learning, among other Zechuyais, Mashiach is going to come. So, the idea of the four exiles is built into the very framework of the world, that in order to reach an ultimate state of redemption, we have to go through the four Golios. Okay, now, uh, in terms of the history, the basic idea is this. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, now this is already in Tanakh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylonia, Babylonia is modern-day Iraq, 
conquered Eretz Yisrael and eventually destroyed the Beis Hamikdash. Okay, that is the Golas of Babel. He exiled the people, and it mentions that for 52 years after the Chorban, there was not a single Jew in the land of Israel. And it mentions that the land was so desolate that there wasn't even a bird that flew over. 52 years. Now, let's trace a little bit of what is described in Tanakh because this is towards the end of the, uh, prof uh, the, end of the biblical period. Um, around 52 years after Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the Beis Hamikdash, Nebuchadnezzar was succeeded by his son, Avil Marudach. That's his name, who was otherwise not uh, recorded in Tanakh. Avil Marudach was succeeded by his brother, not his son, Belshazzar. So Belshazzar is the other son, the younger son of Nebuchadnezzar. In the book of Daniel, it is recorded that Belshazzar made a great party celebrating his father's conquest of Eretz Yisrael and his father's destruction of the temple. And he celebrated by bringing the gold and the silver that was plundered from the Beis Hamikdash and making a huge meal. This is the meal of Belshazzar. It is described in Perik Dalit of the book of Daniel. Daniel lived during that time. In the middle of this meal, a very frightening thing happened. There was a huge hand, and the hand inscribed four words on the wall. The phrase, the handwriting on the wall, is taken from uh, Perik Dalit of Daniel. And nobody could decipher what those words were. They couldn't even read the words. Daniel was able to decipher the words because the words were in the Hebrew alphabet, the Ksabah But they were in Aramaic, which was the spoken language even among the non-Jews in Babylonia. And the four words of the handwriting on the wall are mine, mine, takal ufarsin. Mine, mine, your deeds, speaking to Belshazzar, your deeds have been counted and recounted. Takal, they have been weighed on a scale and you have been found undeserving. Ufarsin, now Farsin is a pun a little bit, it has a double meaning. It means your empire will be given to the Persians or Parsin can also mean cut up, your empire will be cut up. So Parsin has that double meaning. So this handwriting on the wall basically told Belshazzar and everyone else who was listening, your days are numbered. Your empire is numbered. It will be conquered and taken over by the Persians, which is Iran, modern day Iran. And that very night, that very night, now of course it's amazing to me, it says Belshazzar went to sleep. <laughs> to me, that itself was very striking. I mean, imagine what you're sitting at this party and you have this gigantic hand and this message from God that says, you're finished. And, you know, how does it affect you? Oh, you just go to sleep, you know. It's been a long party. <laughs> so I don't think I would have been able to sleep. But apparently, Hilshatzer went to sleep. See, Rishayim in those days were tougher. Rishayim, even the Rishayim were like a, just a tougher group of people. So he sleeps. And in really a bloodless coup, except for him, uh, his servant was in collaboration with some Persian people. Belshazzar got killed. And bloodlessly, other than his, his blood, bloodlessly, the empire passed over to Persia, which itself was a world, you know, became, well, it's, that was the beginning of Persia becoming a world, world empire, right? So we move. So already in the book of Daniel, this is already in Tanakh, we have the transition from Bavel, which is the first Gullus, to Persia. So Gullus Bavel, as a Gullus, in terms of being under the Babylonians, only lasted actually 52 years. Because after 50, you'll, you'll see where we get 70 in a moment. After 52 years, Bavel was superseded by Persia. The original king of Persia ruled, or the original king of, over over the Babylonian Empire at the time of this uh, downfall, only ruled for less than a year. His name was Daryavish. He's Darius the uh, first. But within the year, he was replaced by Koresh. Koresh is Cyrus. 
And Koresh, after 52 years, after 52 years, issued a proclamation, and this is both in the book of Ezra and in the book of Divrei Hayamim, the end of Chronicles, that any Jew who wants to return to the land of Israel is permitted to return to the land of Israel, number one. They could come back if they want. And number two, they were given permission to build a Beis HaMikdash. And number three, the king was even giving financial support in terms of materials and labor. So this sounds like pretty good news. And we were in Gaulus 52 years, and all of a sudden we get the message, we're allowed to go back, and we can build a Beis HaMikdash, and the king is even going to support us. Right, this is called Koresh. And by the way, this wasn't a unique love that he had for the Jewish people. In fact, this was Koresh's policy generally, that Koresh felt he would, it was a political reason basically, he felt he could solidify his empire by kind of being benign and by allowing people to return to their homes. So it was not just the Jewish people, but rather all of the different nations that were exiled, Cyrus had a policy of allowing them to return home. That way they'd be grateful, and if they're grateful, they would be subservient. So this is Koresh's great uh, announcement. I think I mentioned before that um, Harry Truman, uh, they used to compliment Harry Truman because he was one of the first political leaders who recognized the state of Israel in 1948. So they called Harry Truman, you are Cyrus, you're the non-Jewish king that allowed the Jewish people to have their state and come back. And he was taken with that. He was a student of the Bible and he enjoyed the idea, the conceit that he was Cyrus the Great so from, to the rest of his life, he was always honored at Jewish banquets, although you know, he had his own anti-Semitic issues, but basically he was honored in all the Jewish events. And uh, if they would say how great he is, he did this and he did this and he did this, but if they forgot to say he was Cyrus, he would pull at the jacket of the speaker and say, you forgot Cyrus, you forgot Cyrus. He always wanted them to mention. I believe, I believe actually it was Reverend Cutler. Reverend Cutler told him, you're crazy. I think it came from, uh, a very great source that Rav Aaron Cutler said, you are fulfilling the role of Koresh in allowing the Jews to come back uh, to Israel. Now, so imagine this. So you'd figure everybody would jump. Everybody would jump and come. In fact, the book of Ezra records, first of all, the 10 tribes are gone, right? So they're not around anyway. They were exiled before the destruction of the temple. So you only have two tribes, Yehuda, Binyamin, and Kohanim, and Leviim. But the book of Ezra records that 40,000 people returned. Now the problem is we don't know exactly how large the, the whole population was, but many say this is no more than 20%. Meaning a majority of the Jewish people, even after Koresh's call, remained in Chutzlaretz, whether it was Egypt, whether it was Babylonia, whether it was Persia, whichever countries they, they were in. Um, Again, the Babylonian Empire was defeated, but there were still Jews in Persia. I mean, there were Jews in that area of land. Uh, why did so few Jews take the call, of, you know, accept the call of Koresh? It's a little bit of a mystery. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, uh, just on a human, from a human simple pshat, you have to understand that Eretz Yisrael was totally desolated. Everything was destroyed. Like today, you know, you make Aliyah, and, you know, we complain that, uh, you know, when I can't get Ben and Jerry's or whatever it is. Uh, but, you know, uh, life here is not, you know, okay, it's not America, but, you know, it's not that hard. I mean, you can live a regular, red, kind of a regular life here in some ways. Uh, but, in those, but in those days, you have to understand, the land was desolate. The land was destroyed. All the cities were destroyed. There were no houses. Um, there were wild animals. There were local people who were very, very hostile. And in Bavel, people had managed to live comfortably and they managed to establish themselves and they managed to have Parnassus. So imagine, even today, even today, where living here is not so difficult. If Mashiach would come, the, the, the Gemara says, when Mashiach comes, there will be Jews that will have to be dragged here by chains because they don't want to leave. Now, maybe Hashem is making it uh, that the United States is declining so quickly that that way Mashiach will have an easier time of it. People will jump to get here. But still, one understands that if life in Bavel was comparatively benign, 
And life in Eretz Yisrael was very, very wild and uncivilized and dangerous. Many Jews figured, now come for Pesach or whatever it is. I don't have to be there on a regular basis. Okay, so number one, under the leadership of a man called Zerubbabel, who was the governor, the king of the Jews, whatever, the, he was under Persia. He was subordinate to Persia. Zerubbabel led these 40,000 people back to Eretz Yisrael. The Malbim points out, very disheartening, that had more Jews come, had more Jews heeded the call, Zerubbabel could have been Mashiach. And the second temple that's going to be built would have been the permanent Beis HaMikdash that would never be destroyed. But because so many Jews were not interested and did not take the initiative, so it turned into a temporary Beis HaMikdash that eventually would be destroyed by the Romans years later. You see this, if you read uh, all the Nevi'im at the time, you see that they're all talking about Zerubbabel as if he is Mashiach. He's, he's really described in very glowing messianic terms, when in fact it didn't turn into anything. I mean, so let's go back to Korah. So, when this, these 40,000 people returned, now remember, all of this is in Tanakh. I have, not yet, I have not left Tanakh yet. So they actually lay the foundation of the first base of, uh, of the second base of Mikdash. They lay the foundation. They began construction of the second base of Mikdash in the first year of Cyrus, the first year of Kohen. And they even brought Korbanos, and they celebrated Rosh Hashanah, it mentions, all sorts of things. But what happens? Shortly after they lay the foundation, there was a group of people who are described as the Tsarei Yehuda u Binyamin, the enemies of Yehuda and Binyamin, that are really the only two tribes that are coming back. And they wrote a sitna. Sitna means a document of hateful accusation against the Jewish people, claiming that they were building a temple to act as a fortress to rebel against Persia and get out of paying taxes. And because of this, Koresh withdrew his authorization and he prohibited the Jewish people from continuing the Beis HaMikdash. So in point of fact, there was a foundation and nothing else was allowed to be done. And this Interdiction, by the way, Rashi brings from a medrash, although it's not beferish in the uh, Tanakh, that the instigators of this sitna were none other than the ten sons of Haman, who actually stopped the building of the Beis Hamikdash. And Korish was succeeded by Achashverosh of Purim story. So the Purim story happens shortly after that. Uh, and uh, Achashverosh died, and he was succeeded by his son, Daryavish, Darius II. And according to Chazal, although this is not Beferish in the narrative, Darius II is actually the son of Esther Hamalka, meaning Achashverosh uh, and Esther had a child. Now, Darius II became king. Again, this is after Megillah Sester, but this is still in the book of uh, Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemia. And in the second year of Darius II, he gave permission to continue the rebuilding of the second Beis Hamikdash. And the second Beis Hamikdash was, uh, took four years to build, from the second year of Darius to the sixth year of Darius. It's an interesting irony that the Persian king who allowed the building of the Beis HaMikdash was a Jew because his mother was Esther, right? It's an interesting idea that just like people say there's a Jewish pope, you know, all sorts of stories. Well, of course, there obviously is a Jewish, I mean, the first pope was Jewish. I mean, I mean, uh, who is the first pope? Well, right, you get extra credit for your knowledge of Christianity. Uh, okay, yeah, the, the first pope was Peter. I mean, Peter was the Bishop of Rome, the uh, Yashka's apostle, uh, Peter. He was the first pope, first bishop of Rome. 
and he was, he was certainly Jewish, that's for sure. So when people say, was there a Jewish pope? For sure there was, the first pope was Jewish, but there, there are different legends that in the course of hundreds and hundreds of years, there have been secret you know, Jewish popes who were from, you know, who knows? But here we have a king of Persia who actually allowed the second temple to be built, and that second temple, uh, that king happened to be Jewish. So here is the thing. The interdiction, the period where the temple could not be rebuilt was 18 years. Meaning from Korish's withdrawal till the second year of Darius is 18 years. Now, this is very significant. You'll remember, I hope, that uh, when Korish allowed them to come back and start the temple, 52 years had elapsed. But when were they able to start the construction in earnest? 18 years later. 52 and 18 is 70 years. That is why we say the Babylonian exile is 70 years. It actually was not 70 years. Technically, the Babylonian exile was 52 years. But from destruction of temple to the commencement of the construction of the second temple is 70 years. 52 years until Koresh, and then another 18 years from Koresh to the second year of Darius. 52 and 18 is 70 years. By the way, this, this, uh, this does mean that we're counting the construction period. For example, when we say the second temple stood for 420 years, technically the second temple stood for 416 years because you're counting the 420 from year two of Darius. From year two of Darius till the Roman destruction is 420. But the second temple was not completed till year six of Darius. So the answer is when we're counting the years of the Bayat Shani, we are including the years of construction. That, that's, why, that's how you get uh, 420. And, and well, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah. The, you said that Darius II was the one that had the decree to build the Gosh. But isn't, if you read like in Sefer um, Ezra, it mentions it was Koresh. He says uh, in the first chapter. Did what? He says that he decreed to have the Beit HaMikdash built. No, no, no. That, that, that's exactly what I said. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm in sorry, other words, okay. Koresh did authorize yeah, that, yeah, but he then withdrew it, and oh, that was in effect for 18 years. So the final construction oh, was Darius. Yeah, you know, that, no, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Um, after mm -hmm. the second temple was constructed. Yeah. Before only 20% of the Jews returned to land. Was it still the case? Or more okay, so, so, here, so here, here's the thing. You know, Ezra, it's interesting. Ezra, Nehemiah, they came after the temple was constructed, meaning the leader of the Jews during this whole period is Zerubbabel. In fact, in Mao's Sur, the song Mao's Sur that we sing after we light the Hanukkah candles, I hope you understand, this is very obvious, very posh it, that Maos Sor is from the Middle Ages. Uh, we don't know who the author is, other than we know his first name was Mordechai, not, not Mordechai of Purim. And we know his name was Mordechai because each stanza begins with uh, Mem, Resh, Dalet, Chaf, Yud, and then there's a final one, Chazak, you know, be strong. Now, if you look at the structure of Maos Sor, you will actually see that it's all about the four exiles, and it starts with the pre-exile, which is Egypt, right? So the first stanza is about how Hashem saves us from all of our enemies. That's general, that's the Ma'os Sur. The next one is about Egypt, Ra'os of Anafshi. The third one is about Babylonia. The fourth one is about Persia and Haman. The sixth one, is about Greece, and that's the Hanukkah one, Yevonim, that's why that has its own song. It's only one stanza in most are about Hanukkah. The seventh one, the last one, is about Rome, and that's a prayer that Rome should be defeated and the like. So in the stanza about Bavel, which begins with Ra'o Savanafshe, uh, I'm sorry, not the next one, um, Devir Katsho Viani, that's the, the stanza of Bavel. So it says, Kate's Bavel, Zerubbabel, right? And uh, kids, for some reason, that always strikes children as funny. But uh, Kate's Bavel, the end of Babylonian exile, was Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the governor 
who brought the, some of the Jews back, and Zerubbabel was involved with the construction of the second temple, and along with him were the three last prophets, the last Nevi'im in Tanakh, Chagai, Zechariah, Malachi. They were the last Nevi'im, and that's how where Tanakh ends. Tanakh essentially ends with the dedication, the con completion and dedication of the second Beis HaMikdash. That is the end of the biblical period. The end of the biblical period is Persia. When Persia authorized the rebuilding of the Beis HaMikdash. And it's quite logical why this is the end of the biblical period because this is the end of prophecy. I mean, prophecy stops. So as a result, things that happen afterwards are no longer going to have Nevi'im who communicate those those messages. Now, back to your question. So Ezra and Nehemiah came after the Beis HaMikdash was built, and they brought a few thousand more people. Uh, so it's more than there had been, but still it's a minority of the people. That's why during the whole Second Temple period, there was a huge diaspora outside of Eretz Israel. When you read the Mishnah, the Gemara, there were so many Jews outside of the land of Israel. That's even before the Roman Chorban, because they simply never, they simply never returned. Um, there are even stories, there are even stories that there were Jewish communities after the Babylonian exile that migrated to Europe, to France, and to Germany. And there was an old tradition that's recorded in some Sfarim. You never know if these things are totally true. That uh, a lot of the German communities were destroyed during the Crusades, particularly the First Crusade, 1096. And some say that the reason the German communities were destroyed is because they were so old, they date from the Babylonian exile, and they refused to return to Eretz Israel. And the story goes that when Ezra called on them to come back with their brethren, they responded, you can build the big Beis HaMikdash in Yerushalayim, and we will build the small Beis HaMikdash, our shoals, in Worms and other cities. And because it is said they despised the Beis HaMikdash and they despised Eretz Yisrael, eventually they had their own Chorban hundreds and hundreds of years later during the Crusades. Again, I, I don't know if this is true, but this is a story that uh, there are Rishayim that, that record, record that story. So right now, therefore, the end of the biblical period, the end of Tanakh, the end of Tanakh is the sixth year of Daryavish when the second Beis HaMikdash was completed. So, how long was the Persian period all, all together? So, the Gemara says in Maseches Zorah that the Persian period was only 54 years. The way, the way it works is the following. Uh, between Koresh and uh, the second year of Darius is 18 years. Okay, and then you have the Beis HaMikdash. And then you had another 34 years, which takes you to the 36th year of Darius. In other words, uh, 18 years before there was a second base of Mikdash, and then 34 years after there was a second base of Mikdash. Uh, so that means Darius had a long reign. Darius ruled. Um, again, if the second base of Mikdash is, is, is counted from the second year of his reign, and there's 34 years, that means he had 36 years of his reign. Okay, that's how you get 36 years, because from the second year of his reign till the end of his empire is another 34 years. And then what happened was, we're no longer in Tanakh, we're after Tanakh. Yavan conquered the Persian Empire. Greece conquered the Persian Empire. And now we come to the third Gullus. So Nebuchadnezzar's Gullus was only 52 years. Uh, the Persian Gullus was 54 mm -hmm. years. 18 before there was a second Beis HaMikdash and uh, 34, uh, 34 afterwards. So, 50, I'm sorry, 52 years, right? Uh, 18 and 30, 34. Now, you understand, by the way, I hope you understand implicit in what we're saying. When we talk about the Persian Golos, we don't mean, the meaning of Persian Golos is different than the meaning of Babylonian Golos. <coughs> Babylonian Golos meant Jews were forcibly taken out of Eretz Israel and expelled to other countries. 
That was not the case in Persia. Lehepech. Koresh allowed Jews to go back. Most of the Jews remained in exile, but there was no Golas. Even when Koresh stopped the building of the Beis Hamikdash, he didn't exile anybody. Even Achashverosh didn't exile anybody. So you hope you understand that we're subtly changing the meaning of the idea of Golas. Golas does not mean forced exile from your place, but it means a lack of political autonomy, a lack of independence, being subservient, being ruled by the Persians, etc. Okay, so the so Persia did not destroy a base of Mikdash, and they did not exile anybody, but that's still called a stage of Gullus. So, the 36th year of Darius the second, who ruled a, who ruled a very long time, a very cataclysmic event happens in both Eretz Yisrael, but really the whole Persian Empire. The Persian Empire was a vast, vast empire. Eretz Yisrael was only a small part of it. We focus on Eretz Yisrael because that's our land and that's where the Jews were, but this was a worldwide event. And that was the conquest of the Persian Empire by Alexander of Macedon, Macedonia. Called, and by in general history, he is called Alexander the Great, a very, very interesting person. Uh, Alexander himself was the son of a king, uh, Philip, and Philip was only king of Macedonia. Macedonia is a little province adjacent to Greece. So Alexander was not even Greek, he was Macedonian, but, but they were kind of one, one area. And Alexander inherited from Philip a very small little kingdom, Macedonia, uh, but Alexander was a very, very brilliant person. In fact, it's interesting. It just shows you that for money, you can get anybody. Uh, Alexander's father hired Aristotle, of all people, to be Alexander's private tutor, which is pretty amazing. I mean, Aristotle was even then regarded as the most learned person, let's say outside of Archachamim, the most learned person in the world. Uh, he was like, Havdil, you know, Gadol Hador so to speak, and you get him to teach your teenage kid, you know, uh, whatever, whatever it was. So Alexander actually uh, was tutored by Aristotle. Alexander eventually succeeded his father Philip, and Alexander embarked on a military campaign to essentially conquer the known world. And Alexander conquered this massive Persian empire. And as a result, he became a world conqueror. Alexander then, after he toppled the Persian Empire, he turned south to conquer uh, parts of Africa, North Africa, right, sub-Saharan, the right part of Africa, uh, both north of the Sahara and even further south. And uh, he got sick and he died at the age of uh, 31 or 32 or so. A legend has it, he died out of heartbreak because he said he has no more worlds to conquer. Right, that's, that's what happens. When I, that's kind of the situation of, like Obama, like people who become president when they're young, and like, you know they finish it. Like, what do you do the rest of your life? See, that's the thing about learning. When you learn Torah, you'll always have you'll always have what to do, right? But uh, when you have secular accomplishments, sometimes you reach, you go as far as you're going to go. How do you top being president, right? So that's kind of a crisis. That's why you know. When old people are president, it's easier than, than maybe psychologically than when young people are president. So Biden won't have that much of a, a problem there. Um, okay, uh, but the truth is that's the legend. Alexander died because he was in grief, that he has no more worlds to conquer. In reality, he died because of plague. Now, the Gemara itself gives us several stories about the man that's called Alexander Mukdan. Right, Macedonia, Mukdan. Uh, one story, indeed, it talks about his encounter with a group of Amazons in Africa. <laughs> At one point, uh, he was going to conquer a colony of women, again, based on the story that there were Amazons who had empires in Africa. And uh, at one point, he ordered them around. He was a chauvinist, typical Greek chauvinist. And he told the women, I, you know, make me bread. And when they uh, brought him his bread, they brought him gold loaves, loaves of gold. Uh, bread, you know, gold in the, in the in the shape of a loaf, 
And when he said to them, he said, I can't eat gold. He said, well, you didn't come here for the bread, right? You came here for the gold. So here's the gold. What do you want from us? You could get bread where you came from. You know? So there are different stories and uh, different debates that he had with them. And he even said that the women bested me. You know, I, I've never lost an argument except uh, to this group of people. So that's one story. Another very famous story in Maseches Yuma is that at one point, a similar accusation that was made in the days of Cyrus was made to Alexander that the Jews are using the second temple to rebel. And Alexander came to Yerushalayim to destroy the Beis HaMikdash. And the Kohen Gadol at the time was Shimon HaTzadik, right? The, the one that our street is named after, whose kever is across the street. And Shimon HaTzadik came out to be Mavakesh Rachamim and to beg for mercy. And when Alexander saw Shimon HaTzadik, he got off his horse and he bowed down. And he said, you are the man that I see in all of my dreams, giving me advice or predictions. Will I be victorious? Will I not be victorious? I see you're a man of God. You're a man of Hashem. And because of Shimon HaTzadik, he did not destroy the Beis HaMikdash. He let it stand. And it mentions that that day became a holiday. And uh, that year, all Jewish boys that were born were given the name Alexander to commemorate that event. And that is why Alexander is a legitimate Jewish name to be called to the Torah. You could be called to the Torah with the name Alexander, even though it's of Greek origin, it's not of Hebrew origin, because it kind of was accepted by Chazal as a legitimate name. Uh, for Jewish people. Now, what was uh, Alexander's general policy? So remember, Alexander is not, we, you know, we tend to be very Eretz Israel centric. We seem to think that all, all, all the, th the only thing that was on Alexander's mind was, what's he going to do with Israel? Now, Alexander had a huge empire to be concerned about, but he had a certain agenda. And his agenda was he wanted to homogenize the empire. He did not want to have what you might call cultural diversity. What do they call? What's the term? Uh, I don't remember the term anymore. But uh, the idea that every culture will have its own thing. Um, multiculturalism, right? Alexander was not a multiculturalist. Alexander was a homogenist, a melting pot person. Alexander, number one, was very committed to Greek culture, which is called Hellenism. And this includes the philosophy. Remember, he, he learned it all from Aristotle. He, he learned it, uh, he got it from the guy who wrote the book. Uh, whether it was Greek philosophy, Greek literature, plays, athletic events, Olympics, sporting events, theaters, circuses. He wanted to Hellenize his empire in the thought that if everybody had the same culture and the same way of doing things, that would create stability, that would create peace, that would create a lack of war, ethnic wars, and the like. So Alexander's policy is what later became known, I mean, that wasn't the word he used, it, was, it later became known as Hellenism. But the thing about Alexander was, it was a very benign Hellenism. He was not do, using coercion, he was not using force, he was not saying, you know, become a Hellenist or I'll kill you. He was using assimilationist arguments. He was saying it's good for the economy, it's good for uh, you know, political rights, etc. And he was remarkably, remarkably successful. If you go through the whole ancient world, whether you're talking about Eretz Yisrael, whether you're talking about Turkey, whether you're talking about Syria, whether you're talking about North Africa, Morocco, Tunisia, right, that whole area, uh, all of it was inundated with Hellenism. Whether you're talking about mosaics, uh, architecture, athletic events, literature, and the like, Alexander was very, very successful in what you might call voluntary assimilationist Hellenism. There were, of course, in fact, the movement called the Tztukim that we talked about the other day. The Tztukim was a movement during the second Beis Hamikdash. That, didn't, that denied the validity of the Torah Shabal Peh. Uh, one has to know that the Tzedukim were not just a religious movement, they were a social movement. Many of them were rich, many of them were politically influential, many of them were, were, were well connected, and essentially 
their denial of the Torah Shabal Peh was because they were Hellenistic in orientation. They essentially lived lives of assimilated Jews in a Hellenistic Greek society. In fact, many of them did not even speak Hebrew. Many of them uh, spoke Greek. Greek was the language. Hebrew was the language of the proletariat. It was the language of the poor, uneducated people. But if you were a cultured person, you spoke uh, Greek. In some ways, you had a similar parallel uh, in the 20th, early 20th century. You know, uh, there were people like rich Jews in Hungary and Poland, not that many rich Jews, but there were some, they considered Yiddish to be an inferior language. They go, oh, Yiddish is what these poor, uh, poor beggars speak. Uh, if you're a cultured person, you speak Polish or Hungarian. So there actually are, you know, I've met Hungarian Jews or Polish Jews who grew up in a time when 98% of the Jewish population was Yiddish. Yiddish was their language. They didn't know Yiddish. Their parents didn't want to speak Yiddish to them, so they should grow up to be cultured and the like. So there were Jews who didn't know Hebrew. They literally did not know Hebrew because Greek was the, was the language. So this was Alexander. Now, Alexander died young, as I said before. Um, Alexander did not leave a son. Now, it's interesting. Alexander did have either a wife or a mistress. Her name was Roxanne. Uh, and actually, he did have a child. He did have a baby from Roxanne. Uh, but that baby mysteriously died a few uh, weeks after Alexander died. The official story was, the New York Times official story was, that the baby just got uh, fever and died of a fever. Uh, the true story probably was the baby was killed. Because remember, the baby was the only heir to a huge, huge, huge empire. And Alexander had many, many generals who were fighting to get control of that empire. And what was standing in their way was this little kid. So you know, no big deal. In those days especially, it was no big deal to kill a baby. So uh, the baby got killed, and they said, oh, he got sick. And as a result, you now have a crisis of succession. Now, in the book of Daniel, that was written way before. Daniel was written during the Babylonian exile. Daniel has a vision in which a powerful goat comes on the scene. And the goat has a huge, powerful horn in which it butts and attacks anyone that tries to stop it. And then that powerful horn breaks. And from that powerful horn comes four little horns. That is exactly what happened here. Alexander had four generals who were vying. This is all still the Greek period, who were vying for control of his huge empire. Four different generals. And what eventually happened was they divided the empire among them. For purposes of Jewish history, only two of those generals are important. Ptolemy, P-T-O-L-M-E-Y, Ptolemy, in the um, language of the Chazal, established his dynasty in Egypt and North Africa. And the other general was Seleucus, who established his empire in Turkey and Syria. So now, if you can picture the map a little bit, Talmai mm -hmm. has North Africa and Egypt. Seleucus has Syria and Turkey. Eretz Yisrael is right between those two empires. As a result, for the next 150 years or so, there will be a constant series of wars between the Ptolemaic dynasty and the Seleucid dynasty over control of Eretz Yisrael. Okay? And indeed, in the book of Daniel, this is described graphically written many, many decades before this. It talks about the wars of the king of the north and the king of the south. The king of the north is Seleucus and his successors. The king of the south is Ptolemy and his successors. 
And sometimes the king of the south is dominant. Sometimes the king of the north is dominant. And that will go on and on during what is called the Greek period. This explains something very obvious. Antiochus is in Syria. Antiochus, the people, yeah, the obvious question. Why do we talk about the Greeks? I mean, Greece is, you know, Greece is east of Eretz Israel. Antiochus came from Syria. You understand, Antiochus is not Greek per se. He did not come from Athens or Sparta. Antiochus came from Syria, but once again, when Alexander died, all of these countries were under the Greek Empire. And uh, Seleucus has the northern part of Alexander's Greek Empire. Ptolemy has the southern part of Alexander's Greek Empire. And the cultural uh, aspect of it was all Greece. So that's why we call Antiochus a Greek. That's why we call the enemy Greek, but technically they're coming from Syria at this point. Okay, so uh, tomorrow we'll talk about the uh, life for a Jew under the Ptolemaic Empire and life for the Jew under the Seleucus Empire. Now remember, no matter what Eretz Israel is, uh, there were huge populations in Egypt, meaning there were many, many Jews in Egypt, meaning even when Antiochus ruled over Eretz Israel, there were many, many Jews under the Ptolemaic Empire because Alexandria, which was a city Alexander named after himself in Egypt, uh, was a huge, huge community. So, so there are there are going to be Jews in both part of the parts mm. of the empire, but in these wars between the north and the south, Eretz Israel is a constant football, and the like. You know, uh, Henry Kissinger once said about um, the that when there was a big war between Iran and Iraq, he says uh, the only sad part of it is he wished both sides could lose. Mm -hmm. uh, in a sense, uh, the Jews didn't do that well under either of them, so it almost didn't make much of a difference. But we'll, we'll discuss that uh, tomorrow.